Hello everybody, my name is Creator Brian, I'm one of the executive officers here at the UNCC Esports Organization, and I've got two special guests joining me for today's podcast. Do um, you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Uh, sure, I am Nathan, better known as Rich AJ, and I'm the Hearthstone Coordinator. Let's hear for the new guy. Um, fiddles, and yeah, I'm just chilling. <laughs> just want to talk about Hearthstone stuff. Oh yeah, we got tons of Hearthstone stuff to talk about. So, um, if you haven't been uh, paying attention to a lot of the Hearthstone news, I don't blame you and I am jealous of your social life. But, <clears throat> for those of us who have, um, we've been given a lot of uh, bomb drops about stuff that's been going on and uh, stuff the developers have been talking about. <clears throat> so... Uh, I want to go ahead and talk about some of the things, but first off, I want to touch very, very briefly on the state of the current meta. So, if you've been playing any Hearthstone lately, uh, one of the things that you've probably noticed is a lot of aggressive decks, and in particular, a lot of Shaman. <clears throat> so, uh, Rich, let's start with you. Why do you think Shaman is such a prevalent class in the meta right now? I think they just have too many tools to go, go both aggro or mid-range. Especially with the uh, the latest expansion, is just sharpening their senses. Yeah, um, I was a little bit, um, a little unnerved by the new weapon they got when Karazhan dropped in Spirit Claws, and we will talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> but um, another class we've been seeing a lot is Pirate Warrior, um, and I actually just crafted patches for myself just a couple days ago and have been trying out some new aggro decks just to kind of get a feel of how they play and what their strengths are and particularly what their weaknesses are and uh, I've been noticing it. that it's a pretty strong deck on ladder but um, it does have some very specific weaknesses um, have either of you played a lot of these aggro decks? Me? What have you noticed about really. playing the deck? Uh, well I usually get shit on by a lot of control because, well, you know, it is an aggro deck. Um, but, yeah, it seems pretty It seems pretty brain-dead to me, since there's, like, you, you don't really get punished for going face, you know? True. And it just, it just seems like such a such a broken concept in the card game that it you could just like... Go ahead. do that and not get punished. Yeah, and it know? seems like more often than not, you end up getting punished when you trade more than you get punished for going face with those decks. <clears throat> so, it's more or less just the idea that sticking with the original concept of the deck, which is just, you know, pushing as much face damage as possible, <clears throat> ends up being um, what you end up succeeding with. But, um, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about Shaman, and why, uh, I believe, the ratings that we've had last month, the stats that we had from the last season was in the top legend players, 70% of them, 70% of them, main shaman. <clears throat> and it was an overwhelming statistic in that people felt, especially at the really high legend ranks, that they could not actually climb any further by playing any other decks. That they had to play shaman. So <clears throat> I want to talk just a little bit about shaman in a hearth sh in a hearth shell in a nutshell um and why in particular it's um i guess favored against most of the classes and why it has the edge that it does and i think a lot of it stems from the overload mechanic as a whole and um it's been talked about a lot in the hearthstone community and people have brought it up to me a lot about <clears throat> how broken that mechanic actually is and it seems like from just looking at it for face value, it seems like you have to plan turns out in advance. It seems like a very thought-oriented strategy where <clears throat> not only are you just trying to get uh, the best of whatever situation you're in, but you're also trying to plan for, you know, I'm going to use four mana this turn to summon a 7-7, seven, seven, and then next turn I'm only going to have three mana to spend. It seems like a lot more thought-oriented process than it is. But then, when we've all played Ladder, and we all really see the effects of that, 
and how it seems to be more of a brainless class than a lot of the other ones are, and that it really lets itself out to be. So, <clears throat> my question is, is the overload mechanic something that needs to be reworked, or is it fine the way it is? Uh, I'd probably say... Um, you go. I'd probably say it's fine how it is, it's just they decided that Shaman needed more powerful overload mechanics like the four mana seven seven and they just made them a little too strong. Okay. Uh I feel like I feel like, you know, you can't just grab Shaman and take away overload, right? Like it's their unique um effect, just like Rogue has combo and all that. I agree. But you know, people always say that like four mana seven seven is like, you know, busted and all that, which which it really is because it's, you know, a 4-mana 7-7. Seven, seven. Mm -hmm. And when you're playing an aggro deck, you don't really, you, you don't really, you know, plan, a, plan ahead with the overload mechanic because you probably just have, um, you will most likely, like 99% of the time, have like 1 to 2 cost minions in your, in your hand. But what I feel like they should do is instead, like, instead of making a 4-mana 7-7 seven, seven with 2 overload, they could do something like a 5-mana with one overload or, or something like that. That way, it, you know, it's not on turn four and you, you have an extra turn to, you know, make your decision. And I feel like it should be like that for most of the overload cards, like Lightning Storm especially, which mm -hmm. seems, like, extremely busted. Yeah, um, and... I um, feel like it's a really underrated card. Quick but, side yeah. note, Rich, is it possible to turn your mic down just a tiny bit? Uh, yeah. All right. So, um... One of the things that I keep being brought back to when I'm thinking about Overload is how it's essential to have this mechanic work the way it does in order for these cards to be balanced. Because what it's boiling down to is that you're getting cards that have more power for the value that you're getting out of them. And so it needs to have a drawback to actually be somewhat playable and not just completely overpowered. I mean, if we just had a 4-mana 7-7, seven, seven, that's just turn four, you got a 7-7, seven, seven, end turn, next turn, you know, play an Azure Drake or something. Um, it feels overpowered to be able to do that because a lot of decks aren't set up to counter uh, minions that are that strong that early. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the Reno Warlock deck that's been going around has been really popular as well. Because usually by turn four or five, if they've been kind of playing it slow, especially uh, when they're facing control decks, they can usually get that Mountain Giant out pretty early, and that's just an 8-8 that's really hard to deal with. And then, you know, a good probably 80, 70, or 80 percent of the time when their opponent can't deal with it, they can just go ahead and drop that taunt next to it and just go ahead and copy the stats. And now, all of a sudden, they're running away with the game, and there's not really much they can be do that can be done to stop them. Um, so I feel like the two mana overload on the 7-7 is a really good way to balance the card, but at the same time it's not. Because, <clears throat> yeah, you've got two less overload to spend next turn, but <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, you don't want people to be able to drop a card with that much power on turn four and then just go full face on turn five. Um, especially if they're going to drop um, a really powerful five drop or get a good mana curve on turn five with how much mana they can use. So, it's more about... <clears throat> how do we balance overload or should it be balanced in the way that if it was removed entirely obviously a lot of shaman cards would be broken because just it's I mean do you here's the question I'm kind of just going on so I'm gonna ask a question now <clears throat> if given I mean is there really a need to have five mana on turn five if you can drop a seven seven on turn four I think that's what I'm going to go with. Are you saying, like, like, like instead of overload, just locking your mana crystals to actually, instead of, like, just removing them entirely? Well, so, so are you asking? Oh. what I'm asking is, is three mana enough? <clears throat> like, um, if you're going to drop a 7-7 seven, seven on turn four, then does taking away mana the next turn actually hinder your game? in that it's supposed to function as a drawback 
But if you've got a 7-7 seven, seven on the board, you don't really need five mana to keep playing strong. So I guess the question yeah, I'm asking yeah. is, is it enough of a drawback? Uh, well, obviously in, in the meta, it, it shows that it's clearly not... Um, it's not balanced, right? Because say say you're going against a, a, a control deck, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reason why Shaman is like... So especially like aggro jade shaman right now is like so busted is because they can just have such a huge board presence in such little time, like yeah. not even a uh, pirate warrior can like deal with that because you know they do they do have like strong minions like frothing berserker mm -hmm. right that they could eventually buff up but it doesn't it doesn't matter like against shaman because if you're playing a turn three berserker then shaman will just play a turn four um, faceless. And they will deal with your berserker, and yeah. then once they once they're done, once shaman is done with all of the warrior's resources, then they just instantly win. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the reasons that I think that shaman is so favored against pirate warrior, and that's why it's exploded in the way it has. Because a lot of people, um, I don't know how many of you were actually playing the ladder when the season very first dropped. Like I was playing the ladder in the first couple of days of the season dropping, and so many people swarmed around pirate warrior because it was simple, it was easy to play. And it was good. And yeah. I think that's what ultimately caused the uprise of Shaman, so to speak, and you know, the Shaman Stone to take over, because Shaman was a really good counter for it. Because, as you said, Shaman has always had a way of um, making sure that the board stays full, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Especially with the new Jade stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's just one thing. Um, as far as shamans go, and by the way, I'd like to go ahead and take a second to say that if you guys are in the chat, absolutely feel free to weigh in your opinions, feel free to be part of the discussion, and feel free to ask questions, because you guys are as much a part of this as we are, and we do want to hear just, I want to hear as many opinions as possible, I want to know what people think about these things, and um, just the way that the community reacts to these things. So, one more question before we go ahead and move on to the next topic. Is there a way, or can you think of a way, that um, if Overload needed to be nerfed or changed in some way to make it more balanced, what would it be? Now, I did see Kevin when he was in the UNC Esports uh, account. He said, what if there was a double Overload when it takes away mana for two turns? So let's put this into a perspective and say, what if the 4-mana the four 7-7 seven, seven gave you double Overload of two instead of a single Overload? That would just, that would completely ruin the shaman class. Yeah. Unless, well, unless, like, well, yeah, okay, on turn four, then true turn two, you'll have six mana, you'll have four mana on turn six. Mm -hmm. Usually, like, on turn five, or, like, after you play the, the faceless, mo most of the time, when I play against, like, a, a shaman, like, turn four, seven, seven, they usually just like hero power the next turn. So, mm -hmm. but now that I think about it, yeah, I think like double overload, like for two turns, I think that would make it pretty balanced. But I feel like if that happens, like there would there will just be like another like meta defining deck that would come out because of that. So let me go ahead and put an interesting twist on this idea because I actually just thought of this now. Um, instead of a double overload where it overloads you for two mana each turn. What if, in between turns, Overload doesn't disappear entirely, it disappears one mana crystal at a time. So if you play the 7-7 um, seven, seven on turn 4, on turn 5 you've got 2 Overload. If you don't play anything that overloads that turn, then on turn 6 you've got 1 Overload. And if you don't play anything that overloads that turn, on 7 you're back at 4 mana. Hmm. I mean, that would just that would just be like you know better than than what uh, your friend suggested. That would that would probably make shaman more in the meta. Cool. If, like if, now we just gotta if, send um, uh, Ben you know. Bro to postcard. Say hey, yeah. by the way, shamans are a problem. All right, so um, let's go ahead and move on. So, <clears throat> upcoming nerfs is a thing. If you guys haven't heard yet, um, we have two confirmed nerfs 
uh, that are supposed to be hitting around the end of the month. We don't know an exact date yet as far as I'm aware, and if anybody has that information on hand, feel free to go ahead and uh, display it. But as of now, um, we've got two confirmed nerfs, and they are pretty big ones actually. So uh, everybody's fan favorite is uh, this card right here. It's the Small Time Buccaneer. And uh, yeah, this, this guy has obviously been a problem for a while. So the way that they're going to nerf this card is uh, they're going to keep him as a one mana card. They're going to keep his ability, which I think a lot of people may or may not be super happy about, but let's see how it plays out. Instead, they're going to nerf his health, so he's got only one health instead of two. So this is a small change, but overall, I feel like it can have a significant impact. Um, mainly, what I can see from this nerf is uh, druids, mages, and even rogues being able to straight up take out this card with just their hero power on turn two. Which, since most classes are getting their weapon on turn two, yeah, you'll still take three damage if they've got that turn two weapon, if they went first, that is. Um, but at the same time, it's easier to deal with and that you don't necessarily need to commit cards to it. Um, but what do you guys think? I want to hear your opinions. I definitely What's... think this is a better version of the card. There's just so many easier ways to get rid of it early on. Like, especially on that, like, turn one phase. Mm -hmm. What's getting there? Small time? Yes, small time Buccaneer. Um, and if you're watching the stream, I've got it pulled up here. Um, its health is being nerfed from two to one. Uh, I feel like I feel like the health is fine. I just think that the the damage, like like three damage, has always been like a problem it, with like aggro decks for some reason. Like knife juggler getting nerfed from two to three, or from three to two, and like um, what's it called? Uh, Abusive Sergeant and all that, getting their attack reduced. I feel like the health isn't the problem. It's more like the fact that he gets plus two health by just having a weapon is what's broken. Not mm -hmm. not like trying to get rid of him. Because like you can usually like if if you're a rogue going against him, you could just backstab him or you could just frost yeah. bolt him. I mean, obviously you wouldn't have to like if you're playing like a mage or like you know rogue, it would not use up that resource, but you're probably going to end up using that resource anyways, mm. on especially against an aggro deck. So what I feel like, I feel like they should just reduce the damage from three or the plus two to plus one, and it'd be fine. Okay. So um, the one other nerf that we've gone ahead and gotten a um, we've gone ahead and gotten a confirmation on is the spirit claws. So this has been talked about for a while, and I brought it up earlier because. For one mana, and given its ability, I feel like Spirit Claws can get way too much work done. Um, if you compare it to, for example, the Fire War Axe, yes, the Spirit Claws only has one attack while you have spell damage, but considering that a Shaman can get spell damage from its hero power, um, despite the fact that it's only a 1 in 4 chance, which usually it is, sometimes it's a greater chance than that, um, it's such an easy thing to work around, and... I feel like you're almost always going to have uh, at least one hit that's going to deal three damage. Usually at least two, though. And so, um, I like the idea of nerfing this card. And it also kind of puts it more on par with uh, the Jade Claws, which a lot of you have probably seen before. But, the official nerf for this card is that its mana is going to move from one to two. So it will cost two mana after the nerf is confirmed. That's great. Keep it that way. Also, really Skitch like in the chat brings up an excellent point. Being able to mortal coil a small time buccaneer as a Reno lock deck is pretty big. Especially if you've got that on turn one. Oh, yeah. I f Again, like, unless, unless your plan is to, like, completely remove him from the, from the meta, then then, like, 1 HP is the way to go. Because, mm -hmm. like, 
nobody runs one HP minions unless unless it's like something that a unless you can get a lot of like value a reactive it, right? card. Yeah. So like, do you guys like think, abusive sergeant? Yeah. Do you, you guys know? think uh, small time buccaneer is still gonna have a place with one health? I think so. Nope. <laughs> okay, so we've got an even split here. See, I am. I'm really not sure because on one hand, yes, you can still, for the most part, deal at least three damage with it. Um, on the other hand, playing um, some of the face matches I've played in the last few days has taught me that there are so many different ways that a game can start and so many different ways that you can just develop a quick board, especially with Shaman, that a lot of times when you're playing games, you don't even see Small Time Buccaneer. Even though there's two of them in your deck, they just never show up and they're not particularly necessary for the deck. So either people are going to drop them or it won't actually hurt the decks very much. And I'm kind of curious to see which one actually happens. I think that it's going to still be a staple in certain decks, mainly Pirate Warrior, but I feel like it's just going to not be as popular as it used to be. Yeah. Although once the uh, rotation comes out, I believe... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but I believe that Pirate Warrior is going to be on in full swing after the rotation. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you guys more about that later. We're gonna we can discuss that. Um, but as far as the Spirit Claws nerf goes, I feel like this um, does a little bit more to control how much curve a shaman efficiently has, because on turn two, you want to go ahead and use your second swing of Spirit Claws. And at that point, if you don't have spell damage and don't have a, a particularly easy way to get it, you're just going to replace it with the Jade Claws and get a 1-1 in the process. But making Spirit Claws 2 mana forces you to choose. Are you going to go Jade Claws or are you going to go Spirit Claws? And I think that's what they really want to see. As far as um, being able to make better choices when deck building, because right now, Spirit Claws almost feels like an auto-include in a lot of Shamans. Especially if you're going aggressive. Yeah. Cool. Oh, what? Do it? I'm sorry, I, was, I, was paying I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Alright, well... Yeah, it figures. Alright, um, so that is the upcoming nerfs. Uh, if anybody else in chat has anything that they would like to add as far as nerfs go, feel free. Uh, in the meantime, I think we're going to go and move on to Lost Secrets of Ungoro. If you haven't heard about this yet, there was a leak um, from one of the voice actors who does uh, some of the voices for the Hearthstone cards. There was a leak which hasn't been completely confirmed yet, but at this point uh, we can at least agree is probably going to happen. And um, what we know right now is that this is going to be the next... Uh, Hearthstone solo player adventure. Uh, it's going to function a lot like uh, Karazhan did. And we're going to get a new prehistoric theme to go along with it. And I'm really excited about this. Uh, my girlfriend is a huge, huge fan of dinosaurs. Like, Jurassic Park and Jurassic World are all like the shit. And we have seen those movies so many times. So, I'm kind of excited to see uh, what these new cards bring to the game and what this new play style brings. And we're going to talk about rotation here in just a little bit, but one of the things that I think is so prevalent right now is that dragons are a really powerful deck, and dragons have been since they first came out in Blackrock, but there is going to be a time very soon when a lot of the really big dragon cards, a lot of the really powerful dragon cards, um, are going to get rotated out and I'm really curious to see if this new Hearthstone expansion is going to essentially replace it so what if and bear with me instead of dragon decks we now have dino decks so we've got dino priest we've got dino paladin we've got dino mage we've got dino hunter how cool would this be what do you guys think I think that'd be pretty sick Right, just adding in the new tribal, uh, tribal type thing. I think it would be really cool, and I'm really excited about it. So, um, I mean, pirates, pirates, and what is it like, totem, and mm -hmm. like mm. all the other ones is just getting boring. It's about time they added something new. Yeah, and I think that's the reason going on uh, behind the development 
which is that the meta does tend to get stable a little bit uh, after so many weeks have gone by since the new expansion drops. Now I do want to go ahead and name a few cards um, that might be in the new expansion. These have not been confirmed yet, uh, but they are listed as um, credits for this voice actress. So we've got the Golaka Crawler, the Pterodactyl, the Ankylosaur, the Hydra, and the Brontosaurus. But I also saw one leak earlier, I think it was earlier today, that was a new hunter card. It was called a Devil Soar, and I cannot tell you whether or not this is legitimate, but I think it'd be really cool if it was, as broken as it would be. And I'm dead serious, this is not a joke. It is a 4 mana 7-7 seven, seven that only a hunter has what? access to. Oh my god. What? <laughs> right? What's the one that we already have in game from the like, like, first part? It's just gonna forget about that double sword, like, like it's a new um it's a new artwork. Um and it is also a beast. Again, cannot confirm whether or not it is a legitimate card, but if it was, what do you guys think about it? Why are they taking the community seriously? <laughs> we didn't we didn't we weren't actually serious when when we typed in Twitch chat to like Crip or something to give Every class of four mana seven seven. <laughs> Wasn't there someone on Reddit that said they would make a four mana seven seven custom card every day until they get rid of the four mana seven seven? <laughs> that sounds like I something I would one. do if I got pissed off enough to do that. Like, I feel like I don't know, man. I gotta see all the other cards first before I can say something. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see what else this has. But um, one piece of one piece of information has been confirmed thus far, which is that the amount of cards that the Lost Secrets of Ungoro is going to add to the game is going to be close to, if not greater than, what Karazhan was. And what this means is that they're looking to add bigger and bigger expansions to Hearthstone at a time. So we're not going to see, you know, Nax Ramos, where every class got two new cards and then there were like three new legendaries. I mean we're gonna see the Karazhan level of you know every class gets four new cards um, and then another legendary on top of that there's like eight new legendaries and like 40 new neutral cards. I mean this is gonna be a big expansion and even though we haven't got uh, any, sto any solid information yet as far as when the expansion is going to hit or how big it's going to be I can say that it will probably be uh, sometime in April, given trends from 2016 and 2015. Because we looked back and did some research and found that the, what was it, a BlackRock expansion, I think it was, was released in April 2015. And League of Explorers, I think, again, not entirely sure, um, League of Explorers was released in April of 2016. Um, 2016, and April was Whispers of the Old Gods. Was it? Okay, you might be right then. Yeah, um, that's why League of Explorers was like December or something. Okay. Um, no, you're right, because League of Explorers was before Karazhan. So, um, historically, the first expansion dropped was in April of each year. So, I think we're going to see this trend again. Um... And one other thing that I would like to address, one other piece of information that has gotten to me, is that they are looking to release three expansions within the course of this year. So this one they have said is going to be in early spring, and then the next one is going to be late summer, and then the final one is going to be in winter. So we're going to see a lot of new things coming to Hearthstone this year, and I'm super excited about it. Which brings us to the new theme of the year, which if you haven't heard of it yet, the year of the Kraken was the last year's theme. This year is going to be the year of the Mammoth. And I think that ties in again with the prehistoric feel that the Lost Secrets of Ungoro is going to bring. So I'm really excited to see what this new adventure has to uh, offer. And I'm pretty excited to see some of the new cards we're going to play. And really, really hope that sometime by the end of April I'll be able to play my, uh, my Dino Priest. Because I'm really looking forward to that. 
Um, so, moving on, the upcoming rotation is going to be a really big thing. A lot of people have been talking about this for a long time, and there's a lot to talk about here. Like, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say right off the bat that we have got a lot that is changing with this rotation. Um, the cards that are relevant right now are going to be dropped from the game. Um, a lot of cards that were staple cards in the classic set, uh, several of these have been confirmed to be rotated out, and we will get to those in just a second. Um, but for the time being, we've got a list here that Rich went ahead and typed up of all the cards that are going to be rotated out. And in particular, all of the um, really significant ones that are going to be rotated out. So, first off, I will go ahead and let you all know that it has been confirmed. We are losing Black Rock Mountain, Grand Tournament, and League of Explorers. All three sets are indeed rotating out. Um, there are a lot of cards in total that are being rotated out, but some of the really relevant ones I want to talk about right now. Um, at this point, the elephant in the room, I think, is Dragon Dex. Dragon Dex are losing a lot of their really good cards. Chill Maul is going to be gone. Twilight Guardian is going to be gone. Priest loses Twilight Whelp. Um, there's... Oh, what's the guy? Um, can't think of his name off the top of my head. The 5-4 deal 3 damage. Black one Corruptor. Bingo. He's going to be gone. So a lot of these really staple cards that you see in pretty much every dragon deck are going to be rotated out. Which is why I'm kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with the dinosaurs. But let's talk about some of these cards that are going to be rotating out and how they affect the game. What do you guys want to start with? Um, going back to the dragons, mm -hmm. I think they're going to just kill off dragons from here on out, kind of like how they've done with the mech cards. Because they're they they seem to rotate between like one big tribe before going on to the next one. Okay. Like the dinosaurs might be a new tribe that they continue on for the next rotation. I agree, and I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff come out of that. But um, again, we're going to have to really wait and see what dinosaurs have to offer. Um, some of the really relevant cards I want to point out. Um, first, let's go ahead and address the biggest card by far that is rotating out, which is Reno Jackson. Now, when Reno was first introduced, it introduced a brand new style of deck building and a brand new style of play. We're no longer talking control decks, we're talking late game control decks. We're talking control decks that can go the distance and hang on and bring themselves back from the brink. Reno Jackson was, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant ideas to come out of the Hearthstone development team. And that is saying something, because they have had some brilliant mm -hmm. ideas. They've had some god-awful ones, but they've had some brilliant ones too. And Reno Jackson is one of the biggest cards that is, like, I feel like it's almost redefined Hearthstone as a game. Because now, all of a sudden, all of these decks are coming out which specifically revolve around Reno Jackson, most of which um, have the huge drawback of you can only have one of each card in your deck. Now, I have seen some Reno decks, mildly successful, that do... Uh-oh. Ryan. Ryan, you're lagging We're out, boy. We're back. Ryan. Hello? I hear you. He's... I don't know. It's funny. Hey! Hey! Sorry, guys. Uh, not 100% sure what happened with my mic there. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm back now. Um, so that's what I was saying. This, um... <laughs> stop laughing at me, guys. Um, this change has brought about a really, really big question, which is what is going to happen to the fate of these um, no-duplicates decks? Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about, obviously they've added uh, new cards that go along with these themes. Kazakus, uh, Raza, and Inkmaster Celia, to name the biggest ones. And I think that this kind of trend is something that Blizzard really wants to continue. But my question is, how are they going to do that? Because I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of people uh, over the past couple of weeks about how relevant these one-of decks are. And Kazakus, being probably the most powerful 
one of card besides Reno. Kazakus just isn't enough to cut it by itself. But uh, I'm interested in other opinions, so I want to hear what you guys think about uh, the Reno rotation specifically and what is the future of no duplicates decks. Well, if he's coming out, I'm I'm pretty sure like you know Highlander decks are just gone like completely like Kazakus. You unless they have like, um, like instead of like legendary cards that go with it, like more like common cards, not common like common rares and you know epics that go along with, um, no, like Highlander decks too, like something like um. Like like the Cthulhu synergies and all mm -hmm. that, maybe it would do like you know if you have no duplicates, gain plus one plus one or something like that. That would be pretty cool. That would keep it. That would make Highlander decks, um, somewhat viable. That is but, a really good you know, idea. Losing... I don't think I've heard that one before. I like that idea, and I really think that uh, it'd be really cool to see some of those in the upcoming expansion. Yeah, like, you know, the the only thing, like, there's. You can't have like, like Reno is like is a staple in every in every Highlander deck because of the full heal. Mm -hmm. You know, it keep, keeps them alive and all that stuff. Like you can't, it, you can't have a Highlander deck without Reno or like something like that gives you armor or something like like bonus health or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, like if you remove if you remove Reno, you have to have some kind of healing or like armored like synergy with um, not having uh, duplicates in your deck. Yeah, and I think the uh, the new cards that are added in that respect are going to need to be um, they're going to need to be a little bit more powerful than just uh, the regular cards that are going alongside. So, what do you guys think about I'm going to take this idea of just regular common cards that benefit off of the no duplicates rule, and I'm going to run with it. What do you guys think of these no duplicates decks being like aggressive decks instead of Reno decks where they're trying to go for a long long charge? What if we get say a two one minion, and if your deck has no duplicates, gain plus one attack and charge? How what do you guys think uh, that would do for it? I don't think that well, how much idea mana is. It's one mana. Yeah, it's not pretty good. I don't think that's gonna have really be useful because having not like cards where you can't have duplicates, but they're like common and rares. Mm -hmm. You can have duplicates in your collection. That kind of doesn't make sense. Because what's the point of having two of them then? You can only use one in a deck. True. I feel like it'd be better if there was like a legendary, like mist caller, mm -hmm. where it just increased or gave stats to all of your minions instead. Okay. But if you have no duplicates. Like something like that would be better than just commons and rares being no duplicates. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested to see what they do with the no duplicates decks. Um, but I guess we're just going to pretty much have to wait on that one. Let's talk about some more of the cards that are rotating out. Um, how about Emperor Thorson? Emperor Thorson's been a staple card, especially in OTK decks for a while. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a fan of OTK decks by any means. Just because it feels like all they're doing is stalling the game until they can just win right off the bat one turn. It kind of goes against what I feel like Hearthstone should be. And Emperor Tharson is the reason that a lot of these decks can actually work the way that they do. What? Well Anybody else want to? Um, I mean, this just this, this expansion, like this rotation, is killing a lot of the combo decks we've seen, like the uh, Murloc Paladin with any fin, mm -hmm. and just like combos like the overwhelming faceless thing with Warlock or Cold Blood and Leroy and Rogue. It just kills a lot of those. Mm -hmm. it makes you focus more on like what your win condition is. I like yeah. that a lot more. Now, I do want to go ahead and say, because I see the conversation going on in chat, um, the main relevance of Kazakus in Reno Lock is not only to keep yourself at a good life total, 
and be able to clear boards against aggro decks. But in longer control based matches, what you want to do with Kha'Zix is you want to get armor because once you transform into Jiraxxus, you want the very next turn to be gaining armor because that makes Jiraxxus way more powerful. Jiraxxus' main issue is that he's been at 15 health and that's always been an issue. Um, obviously it's one that it's very good at playing around if you're good with uh, playing with a Jiraxxus deck. But with Kha'Zix now in the mix, when you can get, you know, gain 10 armor and summon an 8-8 demon, just like that, you've got your powerful um, drop a big minion on the board feature that Jiraxxus comes with, but now you've also got 25 health instead of 15. You're out of range of OTK, for the most part. I mean, let's be honest, there's the Aviana crap and there's always Freeze Mage, but um, there's so much that really hurts Jiraxxus that doesn't hurt as much if you've got that extra armor. And that's one of the things that uh, Kha'Zix is really good for, uh, especially in Warlock. That being said, I am of the opinion that Kha'Zix won't really be able to hold himself as much. Um, Zulok might actually make a comeback. That is also a good point. Zulok was pretty powerful uh, before this expansion, um, especially with some of the new tools they got in, like the Forbidden Ritual. Um, but I feel like a lot of the a lot of the good control tools that we've had may dwindle a bit and just kind of pave the way for stuff like that to happen. So, with Reno rotating out and with Emperor Tharson rotating out, let's talk about Justicar True Heart. Because just a card, True Heart is one that's been a pretty solid card, a pretty solid legendary. Um, and in particular, the Control Warrior has made very, very liberal use of just a card, True Heart for an obvious reason that now every turn you're gaining four shields instead of two. And in a game that usually lasts anywhere between half an hour to, honest to God, I've seen one that lasted like 80 minutes. A single game of Hearthstone that lasted about 80 minutes. With games going that long, that extra two armor every turn really does matter. So, do you guys think that Control Warrior is going to be able to come back from losing just to guard True Heart, and it's going to be a really relevant deck in the meta when that happens? I don't um, think so. You have to also consider that Execute got nerfed. True. That really hurt Warrior. No, I don't think Control Warrior is going to be a thing. I mean, it it probably would will be like maybe a mid-range, but it won't be like, um, you know, survive until turn 9 and then like drop Ysera and all that stuff. I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Yeah. Do you think it's going to hurt its chances of survival? Yep. Unless they add more armor. I mean, they already have a bunch, but if they add more... Well, they, they don't have as much as they used to, game. though, because, um, yeah, you've still got Cthune decks, and I I don't know about you guys, but I really haven't seen any Cthune Warriors since Gadgetzen came out. Um, but the cards that we used to use to gain a lot of armor, just to card True Heart, is leaving now. Um, the Shield Maiden, I don't know how many of you guys remember the Shield Maiden, but that was a really staple card in every Control Warrior game. And that one's already gone. So... Control Warrior might actually see a really big hit, and with um, with one of the other cards that we're going to talk about in the next part of this uh, stream, one of the next part of this podcast, um, I think it's going to take some really big hits. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Too. I don't. And you know what? At least Star Seeker little... as well. At least Star Seeker is a really good. Uh, staple card for a control warrior who's going to go to the late game, who's going to use all the resources they need against a particular deck and then turn the ones they don't need into powerful legendaries. Yeah, I think I think they're just going to get erased from the, from the meta. I think that almost every control deck is going to just fall off, except maybe Priest, since they still have Raza and Azakus. True. Kind of helps helps them survive 
better than other control decks would after the rotation. It just depends on what cards we get from that rotation afterward. Um, Agreed. I will say it's very, very appealing to have the Justigar True Heart effect um, on top of Raza. It just makes for four healing for free every turn so satisfying. So Priest is also going to take a hit from that. Are there any other classes that are going to take a hit from Justigar True Heart? I was actually one of the very few people that I've ever seen run Justigar True Heart in Shaman. And I'm dead serious, I actually did that for a while, back before Gadgetan was a thing. But when you could get spell damage on demand, and you can get the Taunt Totem exactly when you need it, it does actually make playing Shaman a little bit more broken. But there's not really a good turn that you play that on. So it's kind of one of those cards that nobody really wants to include, but it can pull its weight in Shaman a little bit. But uh, are there any other classes that we really see making use out of just a guard true heart? I personally don't even see like there. There's a lot more powerful cards they could get for six mana. Yeah. Like I don't. I don't like you don't see. Like, I have black Paul's another one of those too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one of the other cards I want to talk about is mulch. Uh, the mulch is the druid epic card. It's three mana and just destroy a minion and add a random minion to your opponent's hand in favor of it. Um, Druid is an interesting class in that we're all familiar with the ramping ability of the Druid and how it can gain mana so much faster than everybody else. But the one thing that it's always lacked, even more than Hunter, is a really good way to control the board and to take out really big threats. And Mulch has been the one card that it can use, for example, against the uh, turn 4 7 7. So when it loses Mulch, what does that do to the class? So as a naturalize, and I think that's simil very similar to how Mulch works. It's a lot cheaper, too. I think the biggest throwback. Like, well, again, it depends on the meta, but, you know, obviously if you're going against an aggro deck, you don't want to give them cards. True, especially when they're drawing cards from their own deck. A lot of the times when you see mulch, it's um, when you see mulch really, really getting value, it's because it's giving your opponent a card that they don't really want. Um, something like a wisp, or you know the four mana one seven taunt uh, Mugushu Ward. Nothing it is um, stuff that doesn't really have a lasting impact on the game. And it's uh, more along the lines of trading one minion for another. Then again, every now and then you get crazy, crazy stuff happen with Mulch. I'm dead serious, I've played a game where I dropped a Ysera on turn 9, my opponent Mulched it, and it added a Ysera to my hand. So then I turn around nice. and play it again on turn 10. And you can just feel just the absolute... just epitome of feels bad man happening to that druid when something like that happens because mulch is their one really good removal tool and yeah you've got naturalized but naturalized it feels like has a much bigger uh downside to it i mean if we got something like match naturalize for a higher cost with less of a downside then i feel like it would be a lot more relevant but when druid loses mulch it basically it's druid entering a new phase of you have to control the board or you're just gonna lose because if druid loses the board swipe just isn't gonna cut it I mean against aggro decks it will but let's be honest I mean it's not like 80% of the game is aggro decks right now so let's move on to a new card um, arcane blast this is a fun one so arcane blast is a lot of the ones or a lot of the mages are running an arcane blast right now and you know, it's it's easy to see why. It's a low-cost, really efficient spell. Um, you play it on curve with a uh, Thalnos or an Azure Drake, and it's just an easy way to clear some of those pesky smaller minions or to just deal the final bit of damage to clear off something that you just need to get rid of. Is the loss of Arcane Blast going to hurt mages? Not really. Uh, I don't see it too much in mage. It's not the biggest need in that class at the moment. It has yeah. A lot of other cards it can use that are very similar to it early. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Flame Waker's getting taken out. Reno's getting taken out. I'm pretty sure Arcane Blast is like not going to be um, used in like any mage anymore. Well, well, eh, no, nah, not really. I don't, I don't think it's going to be good. I think it'll just be like, um. Like, I don't think it's going to hurt Mage at all. Mm-hmm. Well, then again, Mage does have a lot of just uh, easy removal tools. Yeah. Besides Arcane Blast. I don't know. I guess I'd have to see what kind of difference it makes. But I'd, I'd be prepared to believe that Mage can live without. Yeah. The, the, only, the only decks it was played in was in... Well, the only two... Reno, or the only two mage decks were, you know, Tempo and Reno. But, like, since um, the, like, three expansions are leaving, then, like, the whole, um, I feel like the the whole class is, like, just gonna go down. Except, like, Freeze Mage. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Well, um, there like, is, there is another change coming to Freeze Mage that we will talk about in a little while. But first, um, one of the other cards that Mage is losing, and this is a really big one, is Flame Waker. So Flame Waker came with the Black Rock expansion, and it's been around for a while. And it's been a very, very stable card in Tempo Mage, but I've also seen some Reno Mages use it as well. So this, I feel, is going to be a pretty big hit, especially to the aggressive style of Mage. What do you guys think? It's going to hurt it, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just too much of a staple. Yeah, it's just like, it was like the Reno Jackson for Mage. <laughs> the well, Reno Jackson Mage. for Mage. Yep. That's a pretty bold statement, but I like it. So, there you have it. The Reno Jackson for Mage Flame Waker is going to be gone. Um, so there are a Temple. few other ones that are going to be rotating out. Um, not as big a deal, but they're there. Um, Quickshot is going to be one that's rotated out for Hunter. Imp Gang Boss is going to be rotated out for um, Warlock. Uh, Healing Wave is going to be rotated out for Shaman. Excavated Evil is going to be rotated out for Priest. Every Fin is Awesome is going to rotate out for Shaman. Uh, King's Elec is going to be rotated out for Hunter. Living Roots is going to be rotated out for Druid. Bash is going to be rotated out for Warrior. Uh, Forgotten Torch is going to be rotated out for Mage. And Tomb is going to be rotated out for Priest. Tomb Pillager is going to be rotated out for um, Rogue. But of all of those, there are two cards that are going to be rotated out that are such staple cards I honestly cannot wait to see what happens when they're no longer around. And those two cards are Tunnel Trog and Totem Golem. Probably the most staple cards for Shaman right now. How is this going to change the way Shaman is played? Hmm. It's just one of their many openings. And although it may be one of their stronger openings, I think with the newer tools that they've been getting with like Karazhan and all the main streets, they have a lot more like better early games also. So it's not going to be the biggest nerf to Shaman. It'll just decrease the amount of early game they can get with certain cards. Yeah. I feel like it's going to be more mid-rangey, especially since we have Mistress and Mixtures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think it's going to be, like, you know, game-breaking change. And obviously it's needed, because it's, it's too strong. To, like get those two cards away. Okay. Um, one last one I want to talk about, and then we can move on, is anything can happen. So obviously, anything can happen is literally the entirety of the win condition for a Murloc Paladin. And I remember first discovering Murloc Paladin, along with so many others when this card first came out, in that um, when people were first playing it, a lot of people we're just throwing a bunch of Murlocs into a deck and saying, you know, let's just 
let's just play this card for what it is. It's a Murloc deck card. We're going to create a Murloc Paladin, and we're going to just summon a bunch of them back for free. It'll be awesome. Well, for 10. It'll be awesome. But then, the more concept was thought into it, and we were saying, all we really need is the Murloc War Leader, the Blue Gill Warrior, and for the old guys out there, the old Hearthstone players, Old Merc Guy. I don't know if anybody else had Old Merc Guy, but Old Merc Guy was one of the most fun Murlocs in existence, and I loved the hell out of that card. Um, but since then, even now, uh, Murloc Paladin is still a really big deck, and a lot of people are still playing it. Even uh, just watching the Winter Championships, I've seen a lot of people bringing it to the Winter Championships. And so, once anything rotates out, it's gone. So what's going to happen? No really more like that. No more OTK. Yeah. No more OTK. Well, at least from Paladin. Although, also for yeah. Warlocks. Warlocks without... Um, well, I'm going to put a pin in that because I'm going to get ahead of myself. We'll get there. Um, but yeah, so... I feel like a lot of the uh, OTK strategies that we've seen in this meta and the last are going to be kind of melting away a little bit. And um, can't really say that I'm disappointed by that. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I, st I still want OTK Priest to be a thing. Oh god, OTK Priest. Bro, you remember that land? <laughs> when I brought it in? Brought in that OTK Priest? I Fun fucked stuff. it up. <laughs> Fun stuff. Alright, um, oh, yeah. are there any other cards that you guys want to talk about as far as things that are getting rotated out? I mean, we can talk about... about... Thorison. Thorison? Did we not talk about Thorison? No, oh, we, we did. We did? No. How about Astral oh, Communion? Okay. I mean, what's Druid gonna do when you can't just go straight oh, up to 10 right. mana crystals turn 2? I mean, how is Druid even gonna live? How is Druid even gonna be a right. thing? Devastation. Huh? God. Druid's just not even a class after that. <laughs> right? Druid goes the way of old Rexar. That's like... That's like the uh, the Force of Nature Savage War combo. Oh, yeah. In I remember part. the good old days of Force of Nature Savage War. I think that was Hell the first yeah. time that I actually sunk a ton of dust into a single deck. And man, it felt so good to win with that deck. And you know what's crazy? That combo by itself only dealt, what, 14 damage? Because he got yeah. three two twos for six. Each of them get two health, so that's 12 plus the two on your hero is 14. 14 damage. That yeah. was an OTK back in the deck, and that was scary enough to get people thinking. Nowadays, we've got OTK that goes over 40 damage on a single turn. Like, minds collectively blow when you hear that this is the way that the metagame has changed. Can you believe but, how much of a difference that makes? But the thing is, with with the uh, the druid combo, it was just two cards that True. dealt fourteen yeah. damage. With True. the new Malagos druid, you have to almost like draw at like around eighty percent of your deck to actually get the combo and kill someone. True. And that's what so, OTK decks usually revolve around. Yeah, just like massive card draw. But again, like, that's an OTK. The mid-range wasn't an OTK. It did a lot of damage for 9 mana, obviously, and then like, you know, the Thorisan um, drop. I think what, what actually made it the most broken was like, you know, Thorisan, uh, you can potentially do um, two Saboteurs in your hand, and then do like just a buttload of damage. I felt I felt like Thorson was was really like you know destroyed that uh, or really like made that deck like insane. Yeah, I agree. So um, yeah, a lot of good thoughts coming out of this. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any other cards that we're really gonna lose. Oh, you know what? This is one that I feel like a lot of people might have overlooked, but it actually is pretty significant that we're losing it. And that card is Cursed Blade. Oh my god, oh, yes. Now, god. Cursed Blade is the warrior card 
that's only one mana and it gives you a 2-3 weapon, but it's got one of the biggest downsides I think I've ever seen in a Hearthstone card, which is that while it is equipped on your hero, all the damage your hero takes is doubled. Now, there is an obvious reason why nobody plays this card, but I think what's significant about it is in an entirely different card, which is Malkarok. <clears throat> so, huh? Exactly. I mean, let's be honest. It You never see it anywhere else. But now that you've got the one biggest downside of playing that warrior legendary out of the way, all of a sudden, there's a little bit more hope for that card. It gets so much more value knowing that the biggest downside it has is now gone. Do you think we're going to see a, a comeback of that card? Because I haven't seen it very much in uh, Warriors as of late. I bet they'll make another bad one. I've never seen it, unless it was randomly given to them. Really? Yeah. I did see it Trump, back in the Trump good old days of Control the Warrior. Back before the pirates came and took over. You seen it? Oh I've yeah. I've never seen that card. I saw it all the time in Control Warriors back in the day. I've seen it more in the, uh, the Diablo Tavern Brawl than I've seen it anywhere else. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't even know why that card's a thing. Just if they planned on releasing Spirit Club, unbelievable. Good stuff. All right. Um, are there any other cards that are rotating out that you guys want to talk about? Can we talk about Murloc Knight and just um, how you just want to uninstall Hearthstone when your opponent plays a Murloc Knight and then gets another Murloc Knight off of it? I think the most devastating card to be removed is Gorilla Bot. E3. Oh <laughs> man, rip mech decks. The sinners, sinners, like the synergy is just gone now. Like the mm -hmm. rotation is going to get rid of all this mech synergy. With you might as well just get rid of mechs, right? Yeah. Like the demolisher, but, just get that shit out of here. But we are overlooking one very important staple card, and it is a card that the community has very much rallied behind, and that a lot of people really, really like, and that is the Murloc Tiny Fin. That card is going to be wild. We're no longer going to see that little 1-1 one, one Murloc with a really cute battle cry. We can't zero have mana. four 1-1s for, one for free now. What are we going to do? Right? We can only have two 1-1s one, for free. How are aggro decks going to keep up? I don't know. Dude, how is Murloc Shaman going to be a thing when you can't have a zero mana 3 zero? Right? Alright. So, that was fun. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the Hall of Fame set. So, if you haven't been keeping up with the news as much as I have, again, I am very jealous of your social life. But, one of the things that has been revealed, um, and I think this was just revealed today, maybe yesterday, but I'm pretty sure it was only released today, was that they're creating a new set called the Hall of Fame set to go along with the classic set of cards. Now, this has been talked about in rumor and you know, tossed down around the community quite a bit, which was that a lot of the classic cards, or a few in particular, were kind of hurting the way that standard worked, and that nerfing them wouldn't do the cards justice, or they would just completely break the card entirely. So, what they decided to do was to actually rotate out some of the classic cards that are causing problems without actually rotating out the whole classic set because they want to keep the classic set as standard forever which I agree with there has to be something that you know stays uh, reminiscent of the days of yore of Hearthstone and so they've created this Hall of Fame set as a way to shift cards from current and especially the classic set to actually have them rotated out with uh, a lot of the other cards. So as of now, uh, as of the time that we're doing this podcast, there are six confirmed cards that are going to be included in this Hall of Fame set. So the first one is good old buddy Azur Drake. So Azur Drake is going to see a rotation and I really don't know how I feel about this one, because Azure Drake obviously has been around since the opening game, and it's been one of those staple five-cost cards that a lot of 
decks, especially those that revolve around either spells or dragons, are just an automatically include. So, it's going to be weird to see it rotated out. And I'm going to miss it, especially my Golden Hazard Drake, which I opened from a pack way long ago and still have to this day. Um, but my question is, is there a better way to handle what Azur Drake does and how powerful it is for a 5 mana card without just getting rid of it? I don't know. Because I feel like I... just removing the battle cry would do it justice. It's a 5 mana 4-4 four, four dragon that also has the spell damage on top of it. And Drills of Fire. I don't know. It just has too much on it. It just needs to have other cards that can take its place. Do you guys think that removing the battle cry would make it more balanced? Do you guys think that that would make it um, essentially not necessary to remove from the standard set? I think the battle cry is what makes it so good. The spell power I like, agree. isn't as influential as drawing a card is. Especially on turn 5 where you usually don't draw too much before it. True. I don't know how I feel about that. I, don't I feel like it like... would still be fine if it was just spell damage plus one. I don't think it's like, um, like broken or anything. I mean, sure, it's it's powerful, but there are a lot of other powerful cards in Hearthstone. True, like and I think the reason that. that they're going to be rotating this one out is specifically because when you're looking for a five drop, and um, when you're looking for cards to just fill that five spot, this one is, uh, this one feels more like an auto include, and then a lot of people will just kind of give this card a look and say this is something that they need in a lot of the decks that they play. And so it kind of takes the glory off of some of the other five drops that are available. And, I mean, I kind of agree with that logic, but at the same time, I don't really feel like it needs to be rotated. I think it could just be nerfed. I think it's better to just rotate it out, because it really is just taking up too much space in decks such a big staple. True. And I'm, I'm uh, excited to see how deck building changes as they rotate out some of these staple cards. So the next card uh, that's been confirmed to rotate out is this one, which you guys <laughs> you, you guys who have been playing on a ladder have seen this card plenty. So this is the Rogue card Conceal. And so Obviously, there's a very particular use for this card in Miracle Rogue, where they'll build up a really big board and then conceal it, which will make it so that you can't really target anything, you can't really clear out their board, except for AoE effects and just complete board clears. So, I personally am really glad to see this card leave. I think, um, honestly, I feel like it's going to have too big of an effect on Rogue, and that Rogue might actually see a lot less play because this card is gone. But at the same time, I feel like Rogue can still compete. I actually have a Miracle Pirate Rogue that doesn't even run Conceal right now. And I know that saying that is such a big deal because uh, what happens is people are just expecting this card to be run in every deck and they don't see how it can, be, how it can really be a Rogue or especially a Miracle Rogue without Conceal. And I think when a card gets to that point, then I agree with it rotating. What do you guys think? I think that it should be rotated out because giving something stealth, similar to how Master of Disguise used to work, can be really good or really broken because you can't do anything about it unless you have the AoE. And usually you pick stuff like Gadgets on Auctioneer, or you pick your Questing Adventurer, or you pick Leroy. Usually, Warlock is the only way you can get rid of it because they have such high AOE. Mm -hmm. so and Kazakus do also does it, just, does it justice, but so many decks just don't have the ability to run Kazakus. Yeah. So you yeah, guys think that it's just uh, too powerful. You guys think that it's good that it's being rotated? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. So yeah, uh, again, if you guys in the chat have any other thoughts, feel free. Um, the next card I would like to move to is one that I was honestly a little bit surprised about that was getting rotated. Um, and on one hand, I kind of see the reason for it, on the other hand, I don't. But I want to hear you guys' opinion. This is Power Overwhelming. This is a card that we've seen in Warlock 
in a bunch of different kinds of warlock as well. Um, and I think the one biggest problem right now is that it seems like uh, enabling the OTK is something that they want to get rid of, something that they want to avoid. But at the same time, Emperor Thorison is rotating out. So that was going to get rid of the OTK in and, of, in and of itself. Power Overwhelming always, to me, felt like a card that could just do so much in terms of comboing with other Warlock cards. Um, for example, for 5 mana, if you've got a guy on the field, you can Power Overwhelming him, and then use Shadow Flame and just add 4 extra damage on top of the attack of the existing guy to just go ahead and clear the board. And to make it much more significant, um, it also combos well with the Taunt Dude, who copies the friendly minion stats. And I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you power overwhelming a dude and then copy its stats with the Taunt Dude, the four mana Taunt guy, the name is the name is escaping me, but um, I'm sure a lot of you guys know what I'm talking about. It's a four mana Taunt whose battle cry is copy a friendly minion stats. So if you use Power Overwhelming and then use him, he keeps the plus four, plus four on it. Even though your other minion dies, if you were going to trade it in anyway, that's just better for you. So I think the combo potential of this card is really lost because this card is seen as more of a threat to OTK. And I really just don't think that's relevant anymore. Honestly, I don't know why they're getting rid of it. Because I only see it as a problem in OTK. Mm -hmm. Not only are they getting rid of the OTK with Thorison, mm -hmm. Rogue has the same exact card for OTK, but which is better because they can put it on just damage. It doesn't kill the Leroy, and they can just conceal it. True. Granted, they're not going to be able to conceal anymore, but Granted, it's, it's still stats that stay on a minion. Yeah, without killing it. Yeah. So, I agree. I'm not super in favor of this one being rotated out. Now, um, the next card is one that hit a lot of people really hard, myself included. And um, this one has been just such a great card to play in just a handful of decks for a very particular reason. Um, so this card that I want to bring up is Ragnaros the Fire Lord. Yes, Ragnaros is going to be rotated out. Cue the waves of Bible Thumps and Jet. Personally, I'm really, really sad to see Ragnaros go. Um, I'm happy. Huh? I'm happy that he's leaving. <laughs> Me too. Tell us about it. I hate RNG. He's just <laughs> such a good legendary. That's so simple, yet just wrong. They just, I don't think he's like crazy in this meta though. I mean, he's not crazy, but he's just, like, he's a default staple in some decks. And honestly, getting rid of him is going to be really good. <sighs> well, um, I do feel like the whole thing with Ragnaros is that he can't attack so it's basically just as long as he's on the board, he's just randomly choosing an enemy to hit. And I feel like that kind of gamble has been one of the biggest demonstrations of how RNG really affects this game. And, you know, on one hand, I'm okay with seeing him leave. On the other hand, I'm kind of not. Just because it's one of those legendaries that everybody's really gotten accustomed to. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's like it's sad to like see him go, but like it's kind of needed because he's like a really annoying card to deal with. Mm -hmm. And like you don't even get, I mean, sure the like the drawback is RNG, but like that doesn't help with trying to kill it. You like need to trade. You have to trade your minion into it, or you have to use spell to kill it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what really makes it a big problem. True. Alright, well that was uh, Ragnaros. 
So the next one is another really big card that we see a lot that um, I'm honestly a little bit curious to see how this rotation affects some of the decks that we're going to see. But um, the next card that was guaranteed, that was confirmed rather, was Sylvanas Windrunner. What? Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's leaving? She yep. is confirmed to be rotating out. But why? She's not even like... Like, I don't think she's busted. I mean, she's not really busted, she's just... I think it's more just the effect that she has on the game that yeah. uh, a lot of people aren't super thrilled about. But at the same time, you know, it's it's one of those things that a lot of players have been getting really good at countering. Yeah, so like, why remove her? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of... I'm kind of against this removal as well, in that it's not, it's not something that needs to happen to balance it, and I don't even feel like Sylvanas has ever been really highlighted as a broken card or a card that needs to be looked at as far as the meta goes. But um, Sylvanas has been confirmed as being rotated out, and it just, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I don't know why. One of my favorite cards from the... Uh interest gadgets on was the uh, the bomb squad one where it just feel like yes. five damage to a minion and then da five damage to yourself because mm -hmm. that is such a great counter to Sylvanas. It literally, I feel like that was the exact purpose of that card was to counter this card in particular. Like I feel like that card alone just makes it seem irrelevant to then later on just get rid of Sylvanas. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, I don't. I still haven't even heard of anybody really saying that Sylvanas is a problem. I mean, I mean it's similar yeah. to Ragnaros, and like, it's just such a great legendary you can put into a deck, and it'll just do good on its own. Mm -hmm. It's not broken at all. Yeah. It's just like, whenever you see like one of those cards dropped, you're like, oh god, I gotta deal with this. But you don't really like rage at it, like 4 mana 7-7 seven, seven or something like that. Mm-hmm. Unless, you know, you're just, like, constantly getting dashed at, like, 8 damage to face. Like, that's, like, the only that's like the only situation where, like, Ragnaros is, like, a problem. Is yeah. Obviously, if you have, like, really shitty luck and you're just, like, constantly, like, getting dashed 8 damage. But, you know, Sylvanas, like, she's, like, e easily countered, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, like, it is, like, sad, like, having to, like, trade your um, minions and turn to, like, to get rid of her and all that. And but one of the other things that I really love about Sylvanas is that she's not completely necessary to deal with. Uh, one of my favorite things when I'm playing Shaman is when someone plays a Sylvanas against me, what I'll do is I'll use the Feral Spirits to just summon the two wolves that Sylvanas A can't break through and B can't be killed off from. So it's more just like... Yeah, I see that you got Sylvanas, but I'm just going to kind of let you deal with these guys while, you know, my good minions are actually taking the front. So, it's one of those things that, yeah, it's a powerful card, but it's also got some drawback. And all in all, I think it's evenly balanced. I think it's never been a problem, and I'm, I'm just completely baffled to see it gone. Me too. I don't think they have to justify it somehow. Yeah. Well, there's one more card that's getting rotated out. And um, this one I don't think a lot of people are going to have any problem with. It's the Mage card Ice Lance. So, um, what? Yeah, this card oh is being added to the Hall of Fame set as well. And I didn't really understand this one. I do. And I think I can explain it too. The fact that Ice Lance does a really, really good job at helping with the Freeze Mage OTK. Essentially, what is an OTK? Now, granted, the Freeze Mage, like, the, um, the potential for Freeze Mage and how much power it can deal in a single turn is being limited as Tharson is rotating out, as with a lot of other combo decks, but Iceland's really kicked into high gear with what was essentially, I mean, you're always going to combo it with stuff like, um, the Frostbolt, right? So it's literally just deal four damage for one mana, and it's just so powerful in that regard that 
this this card can deal more more damage per mana than even shaman's lava shock or lava bolt whatever it's called for their lava burst that's what it is it can deal more damage than shaman's lava burst which also overloads you for two i think this card is broken in terms of uh, otk potential that being said is also a really good removal tool uh, especially with things like the zero mana uh, spell that just freezes an enemy i mean combo that with this and it's just yeah you're using two resources but you're dealing four damage for only one mana so it's so efficient for what it does that I can't help but agree with the fact that it needs to be rotated out. Uh, it does seem a bit like too powerful, like, but like what you said about like needing two resources. That that's like I feel like that's what makes the card sort of balanced, or like at least like not completely broken is that you need something on top of that to do that. Like True. obviously like Soul Fire is another one mana deal four damage. Mm -hmm. uh, it discards your card, right? But yeah. you don't really want to you you play it but you're like, you know, I don't really want to do it because then I don't have a card, right? If you're playing Zulok, then you usually want to do it. And for um for Soul Fire you don't really soul fire a minion. You soul fire a face. Yeah. That or that also that card also requires two resources, mm -hmm. since you're discarding the card and dealing four damage. So it's I feel like riskier. if you're gonna get rid of, um, if hey you're guys, get rid of Ice Lance. Hi. You have you got it. You gotta get rid of soul fire or something, something like that. Who's joining us? What? Uh, I think that was Ryan. Nice. All right. Well, I guess we got a new special guest then. Well, hey, I'm cool. sorry. I thought this was an unlocked channel. I was just playing Hearthstone, so I, I didn't mean to interrupt anything. No, it's okay. We're, you're, we're you're doing okay, a um, we're doing a podcast on. The, hey, how do you know my real name? East oh, wait, page. oh, okay. You guys have a good afternoon. Okay. You too, hey, Ryan. You too, man. Glad you could stop by. <laughs> well, that was interesting. But yeah, like if you're gonna get rid of Ice Plant, you have to get rid of Soul Fire. If if that's if that's like your mentality is like one mana deal for damage, then you have to get rid of it. Yeah, um, although I do feel like the one biggest difference between Ice Lance and Soul Fire is the fact that Ice Lance has the potential for OTK capabilities, whereas yes, Soul Fire does, but not to the extent that Ice Lance does. Um, when you look at cards that can combo well with, and when you look at how much damage you can do for how much mana you've got on one turn, um, Ice Lance combos really well with stuff like Frostbolt and uh, Fireball, which just all use together in the same turn. One Fireball, two Frostbolts, and two Ice Lances is 10 mana right there. And you're looking at, what, 6, 9, 12, 20 damage without any cost reduction whatsoever. Whereas in Warlock, the best you've got for the same 10 mana is two Soul Fires, uh, two Power Overwhelmings, and then a Doom Guard. And that's, that's still 21 damage, but at the same time, you're not even guaranteed that combo with the two Soul Fires, because if you discard the Doom Guard or if you discard a Power Overwhelming, then you hit that damage total pretty hard. And um, especially with the Doom Guard itself, also discarding two cards. So while yes, you can deal one more damage for one less mana, you're also discarding four cards in your hand over the course of that combo. Do I think Zulok is going to make a comeback? Maybe, but the the thing here that I want to take note of is that Freeze Mage is getting nerfed with the removal of this card. And I think that Freeze Mage has been a prevalent class, a prevalent deck to play since like the early, early days of Hearthstone. Like when Hearthstone first came out, Freeze Mage was one of the really good decks that people were playing a lot of. And it's still prevalent to this day. Like that that really says something about the deck. Yeah. 
really big staple in Mage. Cool. Um, all right, well, that is... Those are all the cards from the classic set that we know of so far that are going to be joining the Hall of Fame set and rotating out the wild. Um, now I want to talk about what Hall of Fame does as a whole. Basically, the way I see Hall of Fame when it's just presented at face value is that it serves to remove cards that they don't want to nerf or just can't think of good nerfs for from standard play. The problem is, these cards still persist for exactly what they are when you go to Wild. So, I don't know if you guys have ever actually played Wild, or actually like sat down and tried to climb the Wild ladder. I've done that, and I've gotten pretty good at it too. But the problem is, so many cards in Wild are so broken, and just have no hope whatsoever of ever getting fixed. Because Wild, it seems to me has become essentially a dumping ground or a, um, a trash can, if you will, of cards that they don't want to really put any effort into, cards that they don't want to see play, but they don't actually really care that much about the way Wild remains broken to this day, the way um, Secrets Paladin is still a really big thing in Wild, the way Freeze Mage is still a really big thing in Wild, the way these decks can make use of the cards that they've essentially cast aside. Like uh, Azur Drake, obviously we've agreed that Azur Drake is a it's a problematic card, but just putting it into wild format doesn't change the card at all. So if you're playing wild format, you know it's still the same broken card, and it hasn't gotten any change whatsoever. And one of the things that I think really damages wild for what it is is because it doesn't receive the kind of attention the standard does. So you're admitting that these cards are broken, but at the same time, you're not doing anything about it. So, uh, one of the things that I read about when I was researching a lot of the stuff for this podcast was that Wild is going to be looked at a little bit more in the course of this upcoming year. And I know that Blizzard themselves has said that while they won't be doing any official tournaments for it, and Kevin, if you're still here, this is something I want you to listen to, and Nathan as well. They're not going to be doing any official I... tournaments for it, but they will be um, looking for specific organizations and groups that are running wild style, wild style tournaments. And it seems to me like this Hall of Fame set is a way to just kind of discard cards that they know are broken so they don't appear in standard. But my question is, why now? Why just now were they coming up with this Hall of Fame idea instead of back when they first thought of Wild? Because what it seems to me is that Hall of Fame is completely just a glorified ban list. And that's, that's what it is. They're taking cards from the classic set that they know are too powerful for what they do, and instead of nerfing them, they're banning them from standard. And it blows my mind that so many cards were staple cards and were not even broken and were rotated out with GVG and Nax Ramos. And yet, they're still there in Wild and they can't be played in Standard Mode. And I feel like those cards could still be there and they could still be relevant in the Standard Play while the cards that were broken, the cards that they wanted to get rid of in Nax Ramos and GVG, um, you know, Dr. Boom comes to mind, uh, Avenge comes to mind, stuff like that. Why don't they just add cards like that to the Hall of Fame set? So, my whole concept, and this is something I came up with back when I was playing the Collegiate Tournament last semester, which was, instead of having uh, entire expansions rotated out periodically like they're doing now, why not just create a ban list in the form of this Hall of Fame set of cards and use that as a way to revitalize wild format so that standard is all the cards except those that are specifically placed in the Hall of Fame set. The Hall of Fame set can be your ban list and then wild is just all cards. I mean, what are you guys' thoughts on this? Because this is something that I've really thought about for a while. 
I completely disagree with most of the stuff you just said. <laughs> well, let me hear I what you think, like, then. I, think... I feel like it's an answer to, like, a temporary problem. Like, I don't... Like, um... Like, back then, when they, like, first introduced it, they just... They looked at, like, GVG and Max Ramus, and they were like, you know, there are, there are a lot of really, really powerful cards in this... in, um... in these expansions. And instead of, like, you know, having to nerf each one of them and, like, taking into consideration, like, every possibility. Mm -hmm. um, they instead were just like, you know, let's just grab GVG and Nax Ramus, take them completely away, and then add in something new, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just having to nerf all these cards and all that stuff. But what do they but, lose from taking those cards that are inherently broken and just putting them in a ban list instead? Well, I don't, I don't know. I just feel like I feel like all the all the work that they put into like making standard up a thing and all that, they would just like throw that away. They would, <laughs> and bless you. Um, that is something that, you know, I feel like they need to sit down and really think about. As in, yes, this is a lot of work that we've put into it, but is that work really necessary? And is that work for the right cause? Now, yeah. the biggest argument that I've heard with uh, what I just proposed is keeping the metagame fresh. And that is a really, really big argument to make because it brings up the entire reason that this rotation happens in that, you know, it's all about keeping the metagame changing every time a new expansion is revealed a new expansion is released, rather. Um, all these new cards are added to the meta and they change the way things work. And then when the rotating happens, like we're on the eve of now, it changes the metagame into something new. And so I do think that that is a really, really good argument to make. And I will absolutely not discredit that. That being said, I feel like sometimes the rotation does a lot of good and sometimes it does a lot of bad and I feel like creating a ban list can ultimately staple upon what's good it can ultimately keep cards that like Reno define a style of play that the, yeah it does sound like if they if their like goal is you know to make the, the game more lively more because there there are a lot of cards in like in the gvg and max that were just just like in just like um what's going to happen in this next um, rotation that are just like you look at them and you're like how am i going to place this deck without this card and like a lot of decks well then again like you know, if you if you take out like a Thoris Sand, right? Mm -hmm. You have to put in something to compensate for that, I guess. But do you Just, though? I feel like I feel like that's how it is, because unless unless you're not like making something with a a similar effect, like like what I feel like they're gonna do like now that Reno is gonna be taken out is just that they're gonna have a a, a lot more neutral healing cards. Mm -hmm. Because there has to be something that, if it's if like either one card or like five different cards that that have to compensate for like Reno's healing. To be fair, we did have a meta game before Reno, <laughs> and it's really hard for a lot of people to remember that because it was two years ago. But you know, at the same time, you can't discredit Reno for what it did. It changed the entire way that a lot of decks are played and it added so much more variance to a lot of these decks and when you're going through your card list and every individual card matters it makes deck building so much more intense and so much more personal like I've seen a bunch of Reno decks and I've seen a bunch of people that play Reno decks and I've even seen the same person use like four different decks of the same class 
all of which are Reno decks and all of which only have like one or two card differences because it matters so much and that it's that kind of style of play that I think we're really losing here. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I feel like purpose wild isn't just to get rid of broken and unbalanced cards, but to just make, make a format for standard where it isn't stale, where we can just put old cards into one section have a place where only the new cards can shine mm -hmm. and you don't see the same stuff like if we were to take out Reno mm -hmm. you can't expect them to replace it with another card that can heal like Reno did because then True. it's just basically the same thing it becomes stale that's mm -hmm. why I'm liking how we had Bran and so we're going to get rid of Bran Bronzebeard and yeah we're not going to have this I don't think we should get a similar double the battle cry True. Or no, we're not going to get another. We haven't had a second Death Rattle version with a like with Baron Rivendare, mm -hmm. whatever you say that. Baron Rivendare, you said it right. Yeah. So honestly, I just feel like with Wild, we aren't just discarding broken cards. We're just refreshing the new current pool of standard cards, so that we can have better Hearthstone experiences. We don't want this like currently we're having a lot of Shaman right now. And if we were to continue, they would. I think they're eventually going to rotate out Shaman, and other classes are just going to become prominent just because that's how a meta works. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Shaman right now is is a little overpowered. They aren't as broken as other classes have been in the past with like yeah. Undertaker and stuff like that. True. Not as big of a problem. Undertaker as Hunter was a really big thing way back yeah. in the day. And to be fair, you can still play Undertaker Hunter. In uh, in wild format, granted a couple of cards have been nerfed since then, but for the most part it's the same deck. Um, but the one real problem I have against wild is that wild just requires such a huge investment, especially since you can no longer get GVG packs. In that you can't just say the cards that I want are from GVG, so I'm just going to buy some GVG packs, like you could say if you wanted a Cthulhu deck and you don't have all the cards for it, you can just buy Whispers of the Old Gods pack without the money or gold and you can just keep opening them um, and grabbing those Cthulhu cards in every few packs you open. But because those packs aren't viable anymore, you literally just have to save up the dust. And as somebody who's been playing Hearthstone for like three years now and saving up dust for every, almost every legendary you get because my luck is so god awful when it comes to this game in particular that I'm dead serious, when Whispers of the Old Gods first came out, I opened 50 packs, 50, and got one legendary. Not only that, but I got so many common cards that I literally had gotten at least two of every single one in that entire expansion. That's how many common cards I've got. That's how bad my luck is. And when you're expecting to have to save up for every legendary that you want, it really takes a lot out of you, and it takes so much time to do so. Mm -hmm. So, it it makes it feel like Wild is not something that they're investing a lot of resources into. I feel like they really don't have an obligation to put as many resources into Wild as they do Standard. So obviously, they want Standard to be current meta they want standard to be what hearthstone's all about mm -hmm. while they don't want to necessarily just forget about the wild cards i think that with what they're doing with wild they definitely should balance it a bit but they shouldn't put as much resources into it as they are wild, uh, standard okay definitely. all right cool um biddle do you have anything to add anything else nah. all right um I am going to go ahead and share with you guys, before we go, a few more pieces of information that have been confirmed thus far. Um, so obviously, as I said before, we have confirmed that the three sets that are rotating out are Black Rock, Grand Tournament, and Leave Explorers. Um, we have confirmed the cards that are, at least six of them so far, 
that are entering the Hall of Fame and will also be rotating out. We showed those off earlier. Um, now with those six cars, I do want to bring up the point that it is going to work differently. So in the past, whenever they change cars, in particular whenever they nerf cards, what they do is they will give you a period of usually what is it, like a week or two when you can freely disenchant the card for its original enchanting value. So in the case of, for example, the uh, Small Time Buccaneer, which is a rare card, rares cost 100 dust to create, and they only get 20 when you disenchant them. Um, to counter that, the way that this is going to work, um, or the way that it will work when it's nerfed, rather, is that you'll get a chance to disenchant it for 100 dust and that'll usually last a week or two. However, with the cards from Classic set that are entering the Hall of Fame set, they're going to work differently. Instead of changing the value of dust, they're going to be worth the same amount of dust. Instead, they're going to add the amount of dust required to craft those cards to your current dust count. For free, mind you, without requiring that you disenchant the cards. So this means if you've got a copy of Sylvanas Windrunner, and it only applies for as many as you can keep in a deck. So if you've got a copy of Sylvanas Windrunner, when these cards rotate out, you are given 1600 dust for free. You may then, if you choose, disenchant Sylvanas for 400. Same thing goes with Ragnaros, Ice Lance, Power Overwhelming, Conceal, and Azur Drake. Um, the legendaries obviously will only give you uh, one hit of legendary dust, the other ones will give you two. So if you don't have these cards, I highly recommend that you craft them just because you're essentially crafting them for free. Um, I do not know, and I would really, really like to know, uh, how this affects regular versus golden cards. So for example, as I said earlier, I have a golden Azur Drake, and I have two regular Azur Drakes, total three. So I can't say for certain if I'm going to get the dust for the two regular Azure Drakes or the dust for one regular and one golden or if I'm going to get the dust I for all three. I did say you'd get at least, if you have the golden, it'll do a golden and then common if you don't have a second golden. Okay. Um, they will do that with legendary, where if you have a golden and a regular, they'll go for the golden instead. Okay. So uh, you guys heard it here first. That's how... Uh, it should work when that happens. Um, as of when the rotation happens, uh, we don't have any guaranteed uh, information at this point. However, I can say it is likely to happen in August. The nerfs are very, very likely to happen at the end of the month. Uh, the end of this month, that is. So within the next two weeks or so. And that's... Uh, that's about all I got. You guys, anything else that you guys want to add, or any other questions that you guys want to discuss? Nope. I think with the three expansions, they said they were gonna this for this year. They were gonna have about 130 cards per expansion. Yes. And you know what? That also brings up another point that I forgot to mention, which was that this is the last adventure type expansion that is going to work in the way that adventures do. And uh, I'm really glad you brought that up because that reminded me of something that I read today that uh, likewise was confirmed by Blizzard, which was that the way that adventure expansions are going to work is that they're still going to add solo, um, solo adventures in the way that they currently have them, but that the cards themselves aren't going to be granted for free like they always are. Um, the solo adventure will be free, and it's essentially going to be a story kind of element. But the cards, as far as I've been, as far as I've been able to understand about this, is going to work. The cards are going to be offered just like regular expansions are going to be with actual packs. So take that at face value. That's that's all I got. <laughs> So essentially, the adventures are no longer going to be just standard adventures. They're just going to be new expansions 
with adventures to go with them. Not, lit. yeah, not. I'm not feeling great about that. It seems more to me like it's just a money grab, essentially. Yeah. Where they're just trying to make you buy more packs. And I've never really been a fan of that. Yeah. But at the same time, it makes me wonder why get rid of GVG packs then? If their entire goal is just to make more money, don't you feel like getting rid of GVG packs actually hinders that? Yeah. I think they made a big a big fuck up and they're like, oh snap, you know, we lost a lot of money by not having GVG in that set. Yeah. I so mean now they're like let's remove the adventures mm -hmm. to like compensate for the, all the money we lost. Yeah. Well, uh but let's just hope that they decide to make some better financial decisions here on out. And um mm -hmm. kinda hoping that they really listen to their community a little bit more often. Because I really, really wanna see a lot of the things that I've seen out of the community come to fruition. And I think, you know, I think the design team of Hearthstone knows what they're doing to an extent, but I also think they really could be doing more as far as, you know, how the meta changes and what's wrong with the meta. I mean, I was looking over Ben Brode's uh, personal statement about the January season, and his stats were wrong. Like I talked about earlier in the earlier in this stream about how shamans made up seventy percent of the high ladder, and he seemed to think they only made up like forty. I don't understand how, if you're the developer of these games and you have the stats in front of you, how you get them wrong. <laughs> it's I ridiculous. Don't understand? Because I was watching streams. All throughout January, people were actually sitting there in the last um, in the last few days of the season, actually counting the decks that they played, and every single one of them that were doing that were seeing the heavy majority of shamans. So I don't see how you get that stat wrong when it's right there in front of you. But yeah, I mean. It seems like either he's not paying the right attention or he's just not paying enough attention to it. And I feel like that's one of the biggest frustrations at this point is that it's more just, you know, how much you actually look at the community and how much you actually see from their side of, from their point of view. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think uh, there's nothing else to talk about. If uh, chat doesn't have any other questions or discussion topics for us, then uh, I think we'll go ahead and call this a day. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rich and Biddles, for joining me on the, po the uh, podcast today and the stream. And uh, it's been really great talking to you guys. Really enjoyed hearing your opinions and what you guys think about uh, all these things that are going on and what's causing them. So um, thank you guys again, and um, thank you for taking the time out and joining me. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And um, if you are not already a member of our community, you can find us at uh, any of the two links on the stream here, our Facebook group and our Twitter, our official Twitter. So... Um, those are the places you can find us and get involved with the group and get more information if you are a student at UNC Charlotte or a UNC Charlotte alumni. We do accept both. And um, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, wind down here. So thank you guys for watching. We will be back probably, I don't know, we'll be back again some other time. We're going to do this again probably. But um, I think that's all we've got to cover today. So thank you guys for watching. Stay classy. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye.